Um, it's my uh, privilege uh, today to be um, talking to writer Alice Lyons as part of uh, Corja Connected. Um, so this is part of the Corja Arts Festival uh, online programme. So Alice is a writer whose work embraces the visual arts. She's received the Patrick Kavanagh Award for Poetry and the inaugural Ireland Chair of Poetry Bursary. Her previous publications have included Staircase Poems in 2006 and The Bread Basket of Europe in 2016. Alice is originally from the US, where she was Radcliffe Fellow in Poetry and New Media at Harvard University from 2015 to 16. She has lived in the West of Ireland for over 20 years, and she lectures in writing and literature at the Yates Academy of Arts, Design and Architecture in IT Sligo. So, Alice. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking today to Alice about her debut novel, uh, Una, which was very recently published. Um, and I'll just tell you about some of the reviews, what people have said. Uh, Jessica Trainer called it a study of grief and recovery through the lens of art, colour and landscape. Moving and wise, few portraits of grief are so life affirming. Owen McNamee said, Una is rich in physical and psychic texture. Lines', Lines eye is acute and compassionate, her voice alive to the vivid possibilities of language, the writer utterly in command of a singular vision, a virtuoso work. Anne Cunningham in The Independent called it an ingeniously crafted marvel, and Tom Lyons um, in another review um, called it, uh, where are we, a technical marvel in its own right. And actually, as I looked for um, reviews, and comments from people, the word Marvel appeared in pretty much every one of them. So congratulations, uh, Alice. So do you want to begin by reading? Sure, yes. Right. I'll read a couple of small extracts from um, the US. The book is Una, it's about Una, um, and her, her um, growing up in a suburb in um, the United States, uh, in the Northeast, in New Jersey. And, um, she grows up in a, in a family and in a community of first-generation immigrants from mostly Europe. Um, in this project of these first-generation immigrants losing their identities, they're trying to earn more money and move up the, the ladder, uh, the property ladder, the social ladder, and so on. And not everybody moves up the ladder. so. It, people are left behind, usually aunts and uncles and cousins and stuff. Yeah, there's that passage, um, it, it might be in this chapter, yeah. um, um, where Una visits as a, as a child um, relatives yeah. who haven't quite moved far enough. There you go. So it's okay to go and visit them, but they never come to the kind of new shiny that's place. That's right, yeah. exactly. So they, so, as if they know their place. Or, exactly, yeah. so that's what I'm going okay, to read to you. So, the car was an us place. She and me, else dad and she and me traveling visiting relatives less, less rich than us in Fairlawn and Midland Park, relatives that were teachers and clerks and insurance, insurance agents and candy sellers, still immigrant tinged and living with recent immigrants. Dad, an executive, which barricaded us away in the white places. Tenement and hue free we were. The car, the vehicle that bridged us and the relatives, severed by the cash difference. The car carried us the distance the cash didn't span. We swam in the relatives' inflatable baths, ate their grilled meats. Adults drank their martinis and Manhattans in their less leafy tracts with less acreage. They never said there was a cash gulf, but there was. It was felt. We visited them. They never visited us. Stranded in the affluent suburbs that were indigent free, every minimum single acre resident in that suburb present grew up in a crammed sibling bed past. New hunger, new handball in the streets were tainted, sepia tinted, grannies and granddads in dirty rags and need, grueling sea travels that were unspeakable. Laundry hanging between buildings, ladies peeking behind starched lace curtains. Time passed, wars. The 1950s arrived and wham, in came shiny appliances, marble baths, laundry chutes, mini bars, multiple car garages, car key swinging parties that freaked them 
in their disremembering track with its single future-based cash accumulating hue-free path. Severance, strandedness, it was felt. I felt it as a chill in my center, a slashed umbilicus when we left the relatives' parties in the denser areas and headed back up 208 past the trees. Urban Farms was the suburb name, past the club and the lake where the suntan cream slicked the surface in summer. It was like being cut, but it was said we were lucky, privileged. It was a time slice in the American myth dream, and it was pervading. It paved life's vagaries, varieties, uncertainties, eschewals with urgency. That life was a bright, flat, white space that lacked penumbral shades and skins. Darkness, in its rich varieties and death as a simple fact, didn't figure. It was a Klieg light, leisurely life with big cars, fake ski areas, and subterranean IBM missile bases where Indian land had been. Sun-drenched and untrue, it was a ruin in the making. And I'll just read one more little part from the next chapter um, over um, that's quite related to um, the suburb and the way that it was set up. So the suburb is called Urban Farms. Mm -hmm. They named the place Urban Farms, urban because they were Patterson street kids and urban was safe, familiar. Farms in the undistant past had failed. Farms had meant peasants, mud, penury, burden beasts, sepia grannies and granddads in smudged rags, hunched, battered in huts, famine, disease. Farms were unsuccessful. Farms were unclean. Urban farms was a new clean thing. Urban farms residents didn't till the land. They plunked residences, landscaped the landscape. They hired newly arrived Italians and Hispanics as lawn guys. They didn't get their hands in that dirt. What, are you kidding? They had azaleas in it, nice trees, silver birches, larches, Canadian and Japanese maples, pines. Kids kicked balls and played tag in that landscape. The lake was a nice blue surface in the view. It was a pretty picture, a leisure land. The streets that meandered urban farms were named after the extirpated, uh, extirpated tribes that lived in the land in preceding millennia. Pawnee Lane, Apache Street, Blackfeet Avenue. The far-flung plains, western and desert tribes were featured. They had cachet, a bit different was the way it was put. Lenny, Lenape, Munsee, Delaware, the actual tribes that had lived in what was current New Jersey. I didn't see any streets named after them. That was realer than was wanted. The land had been actually their place and they had descendants still existing nearby in the Mawa Hills. But they were shunned and it was whispered that they were Civil War era runaway slaves mixed, in quotes, with natives. They were given the slur name, the Jackson Whites. Better keep things mythic with faraway tribe names as this created the dreamscape that was wanted. Actual living native beings weren't desired. What was desired were extinct names, the idea that there wasn't a native living in the present. The present was us, white, and Cadillacs, cul-de-sacs, little league, swim meets, Sunday mass, barbecues, tennis matches, pancake breakfasts, breakfasts, drunk priests, cutting edge appliances, mean and frustrated nuns, basketball games, seven sacraments, pets, illicit affairs, Hawaiian punch. We were a replacement narrative. The natives were the past. Great. So there's not just, um so in that passage, and I guess through the book, it isn't just about the, um, the erasure of the native people. There's a lot going on about, um, about recent immigrants um, wiping out their past. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. yep. Um, like if you go in the graveyard in this suburb where um, the book is set, the, the names have 
many vowels missing. You'd see Italian names that might have um, a few vowels lopped off the, the back or names that used to be complicated, more simplified. Mm -hmm. So there's this sense of like just kind of shaving the edges off of mm -hmm. everything and making everything similar yeah. to assimilate, wow. you know? A lot more uniform. Yeah. Um, and actually there was another passage that I was thinking about that I, um, that I read, and it's where um, a young Una um, visits Ireland. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's just about this, you know, the idea that the people in urban farms don't want to touch the dirt or mm -hmm. get involved with, yeah. with it. But um, young Una um, goes to, to visit Ireland and comes back with a very particular uh, souvenir mm -hmm. as right. well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's a scene where she goes to visit uh, relatives on a farm in Roscommon and um, watches turf being cut for the first time and kind of can't believe that, um, that earth is dried up and burnt. You know, it just kind of freaks her out mm -hmm. because in um, her situation, heat came from just turning on a switch, mm -hmm. you know? So um, the uncle in the story gives her a piece of turf which she packs in her Pan Am bag mm -hmm. and flies back to her bedroom mm -hmm. in New Jersey with it and she stuffs it in the back of this cabinet. Mm -hmm and it stays there. She's kind of wrapped it in paper towels and it stays there for quite a long time until... Yeah, and I love that, um, that she initially wraps it in the Balhadrine news oh, yeah. to bring it home. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and, and, um, and there's another image as well that I really love. It's um, at this idea of, of the sepia-coloured um, mm. people because there is so much going on about, um, about colour, you know, especially... Well, I suppose it starts quite early on with, um, with Una's um, kind of early visits to art classes mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. Um, and just how that's carried through. But, um, yeah, so do you want to talk about that or, you mm -hmm. know, the, the, the idea of the sepia and yeah, yeah sure yeah i mean the color i mean the book is all there's a whole lot in the book about color but yeah sepia tint um i mean i think one of the things that um that i'm trying to do in the book and to write about is um this idea of the um, erasure of history and that sepia the sepia tint is the color of the old photographs mm -hmm. and the old photographs of the grannies and granddads who've struggled to get over, mm -hmm. who've suffered and have had to leave mm -hmm. um, as uh, refugees, we'd call them economic migrants now, um, that that history is, it's, it's sepia tinted, which is also dirty, mm -hmm. you know, and in both dimensions, that's something you want to put yeah, away. Yeah, that's true, because even black and white is quite crisp or something, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah but there's yeah. a kind of grubbiness about, about sepia, yeah. Totally. So we want to get it away. And the same with the language of um, Greek um, immigrants or Italians, um, people who have native languages that aren't English. The idea of just keeping that language alive was anathema in this kind of situation. And that's something that I think Una is, is constantly aware of. And she's observing these people just kind of putting that all away in a mm -hmm. box and locking it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and wanting everything really clean and shiny and new and um, very little talk of the past. Mm -hmm. um, only, only in a kind of uh, super nostalgic way mm -hmm. um, or a kind of quaint story about um, one's roots. Okay, so the old country. So the old in some very romantic way. Yeah. yeah but yes, well, it's clearly, they don't think it's romantic at all because they just want to, to wipe it out. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah um, th there's another image that I think is really um, strong I, um, and it's, um, it's of the Indian arrowheads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So throughout the book, uh, at every kind of chapter head, there's an image um, of an arrowhead. Um, these were put on the um, tied onto um, shafts of arrows. And in this part of New Jersey, um, urban farms, um, there is, um, in the history of the land on where Una is set, all of these old Indian trails um, where lots of Native American tribes, because the area is kind of mountainous with lots of lakes, there were lots of wild animals that they hunted. Mm -hmm. And so the landscape is covered in these Indian arrowheads. and. As Una's playing with her friends uh, in the forest, they come across these things all the time. And there, there are these um, you know, remnants of the recent and ancient history of the land. But there's this sense of disconnection to where they are. Mm -hmm. and, and what I was trying to write about was this, this way that a people in trying to become something, and um, James Baldwin says you know, that these people 
are, um, I forget the exact quote, actually I think I've got it written down here because this meant a lot to me when I was writing. He says, and have brought humanity to the edge of oblivion because they think they are white. So it's this project of this community in creating this idea of being white and of being supreme over other people that they have to disconnect themselves from the reality of the history mm -hmm. of who they are internally, mm -hmm. who they're, who, where, their genetics, mm -hmm. but also of the land that they live on, which has been plundered, which has been, you know, the, the people who used to live on it have been essentially uh, extirpated or else shipped across to reservations mm -hmm. in the West. Um, and so the, the children in the book, they find these arrowheads, but they're, they're almost like cowboy and Indian little relics mm -hmm. that they collect and they put in their bedrooms, you know, on shelves, but they make no connection mm -hmm. between those things and where they live. It's more like a connection to the movies, you know, or to a game. And, and how recently would there have been um, native people living on that land? Was uh, it the 19th century, late 19th century? Late 19th century. Wow, well, yeah. so recent, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and so the estate was built in the late 50s, is that right? That's right, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, bought, the land was bought by the Catholic Church and then sold to um, wealthy uh, Irish-American mm -hmm. developers who then, who then built this community. Mm -hmm mostly for Catholic immigrants from the big cities. The kind of Patterson um, that the, is the kind of Belfast of that community. It's a, a mill town okay. that made silk. Yeah. Um, and many, many people uh, in the 19th century would have emigrated there to work in the silk mills. And then when they made their way up the ladder to a certain point, then they would go out to the suburbs and uh, get bigger houses. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so do you want to read a bit more for sure. us? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll, read, um, I'll read a couple more short extracts. I think these are, these are shorter. Um, so this has to do, these two extracts have to do with um, another theme of the book, which is about um, language and how, you know, I was talking about they were kind of shaving off the rough edges of their European sepia colored, dirty, mm -hmm. quote, um, heritage, it was also happening to their language. Mm -hmm. So the richness of um, speech, um, something that Una later on in the book reconnects with when she moves to Ireland, um, the richness of speech is, is taken out of the language in this, again, this desire to assimilate and to kind of be like everybody else. So we wouldn't use words that um, might be seen as being different or marked by so nothing ethnicity. that was associated yet with with a, a sort of previous life or with the heritage or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Foods, you know, mm -hmm. th those kind of ethnic foods. Really, so all be... of that even disappeared, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was something, so, but then the, the Italian restaurant thing, you know, the veal piccata and right. stuff. Yeah. And so that was obviously acceptable. That was an acceptable form of yeah. ethnicity, was it? That kind of um, version of, uh, of Italian cooking that was available. Yeah, in, in, as like a restaurant experience. Yeah. And of course you'd have, you would, you would definitely have families in that community. And there's, there's a lot in the book about the Italians in the neighborhood that would keep their cooking alive. Mm -hmm. But there was also this kind of um, pretense to, or, or, or sometimes even shame about that kind of stuff that it was associated with the old and they'd want to in the 1950s and 60s, you know, start to make these kind of casseroles mm -hmm. and stuff that would appear in these women's magazines, okay. you know, with like yeah. lots of mushroom soup, Campbell's. Yeah, the soup and yeah, tuna yeah. and stuff, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Great. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so. So here, Una and her friend are playing in the basement and playing around with language. We played in the cigar-scented basement lair that held Dad's bar and the taxidermied sailfish with the wall eye he caught in the Caribbean. Lisa, with her wavy tresses fastened with a fastener like twin shiny gumballs. We giggled at rhyming ditties, Dr. Seuss and stuff we made up. A few lines cause laughter spasms every time we read them, a cause and effect experiment that never failed us. 
And this is a quote from Dr. Seuss. A very fresh, green-headed, quillican quail sneaked up from in back and went after my tail. We created sexual escapades with Barbie, Francie, and Ken, but we called him Big Daddy O. Williams. His arrival was always heralded by a jingle sung with a flabby-lipped and puffy-cheeked Bing mimicry. The pitch went up at the last syllable. It's Big Daddy Williams. When he arrived in Barbie's and her flat-chested friend Francie's space, the dynamics changed and shit hit the fan. Tempers flared and nude plastic slapped in pretend verbal abuse and sexual experiment. We giggled. Upstairs, language was being disremembered. Grannies and granddads might emit strange guttural speech that was crazy and embarrassing. Get them away. Get them in that graveyard quick. We wanted a new speech, a tasteful talk, beige as the carpets in the hallways and the granite kitchen surfaces emerged in urban farms. Sentences were clipped. Chats ended quickly as if every remark was a serve. The player failed returning. The ball disappeared in an invisible swale. Bland terms, great, nice, neat, and uh, bleached speech. Ask and get a quick answer. It was helpful, but pretty dismal as well. An emptiness invaded the very thing that linked us. As language disintegrated, we did as well. Didn't we all miss the sweetness in speech? Cease that infernal giggling. Upstairs, she yelled at us. We giggling in the basement. And then I'll read one more bit here um, for when she gets to Ireland and starts to um, hear the way people use language in her rural village in Leitrim. My village. It will always be my village, always, even when I'm far away. My village with the river. Yatesville in the west, Cavanaughville in the east, what will certainly be Heaneyville in the up, and McGahernville spreading rapidly. The dung-hued, finger-shaped signs depicting a quill in an inkwell gauged the high literary qualities in the Irish landscape. I'd watch guests alight their river cruisers, walk expectantly up the path near the bridge, gaze at the blank village triangle. Then their spines had slump a little. There wasn't much in the village, a pub in the distance, the big white church, scattered dwellings, the empty center. It wasn't amenities that made the place, that was certain. The village's language was backed up in a field. In a field, a well was ruined with a dead sheep. An evil being did it with intent. They all knew which he was, but weren't saying. Dead sheep in a well will ruin the water perpetually. Glittering shreds fluttered in a tree by the water, but didn't greet it. Tied there were key rings, were medals with blue rickrack, were bits well-wishers had in their cars, plastic centra bags, tied there, flittering. The language was in the field, it wasn't in the well. But the well wasn't far, behind where I lived. I lived near the field. The well was up the lane apiece. All the villagers put the language in the field, in the ruined quarry beside where Lavin gratified his dark need with the children in McGahern's tale. Lavin, they all feared Lavin. They knew what he did but didn't say. Lavin, the name, and the tale's title. The name is a term, in the term is a field with a quarry. The villagers and the elderly that lived in the lanes dumped all their language in the quarry pit and dumped turf in it, which is dark but friable and effervescent in its lightness. What grew in the earth was a tuber, the tuber was a term, and the term was a name. What jerk put a dead sheep in a well and ruined the water? The grave digger said the man that did it was the devil incarnate. We met at the bridgehead, maybe it was New Year's Day when he said it. I said it was blather, grudges, this side Fianna Fáil, that side Fine Gael. He said the man was the devil incarnate and he lived in the village near me. Yanks knew fridges and appliances. We knew gates that are big strided and determined. Yanks didn't meander. We knew ch children in freshly pressed attire, their gleaming patent leathers like shiny magazine pictures pasted in the grimy newsprint, a summer's day in Leitrim. 
They said the villagers were a special breed because their elders had been servants in the big place, being discreet, as they called it. It was bred and bet in them. Take all the mum individuals in Ireland, and these were the mummest. Um, so um, there's a lot, I suppose, uh, like you mentioned earlier um, about seeing those gravestones um, in, in New Jersey where letters and stuff were missing. Mm -hmm. So I can't talk to you about this book without, and you know that some vowels had been shaved off. <laughs> so I can't talk to you about um, Una without asking you about um, the, the lipogram element of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious about at what point in, in the process, mm -hmm. um, because I, I know that it says it's a novel, but mm -hmm. there's so much else going on as yeah. well, because there are visual elements mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, that are used in lots of different ways. And um, so in the text and then in the images, mm -hmm. um, and then in, uh, and I think there's something about, you know, there's just that one short section um, where the letter O is used mm -hmm. and how that, I didn't even, when I read it, I didn't even realise what was different about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, until, I think I was probably about a page in mm -hmm. um, and thought, oh my God, there are O's. Here. There's a lot of space. <laughs> <They're> like, oh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious about um, really what you set out to do mm -hmm. yeah. with the novel. Well, I, this book started out um, uh, as me trying to write about kind of the two sections that I just read. So me trying to write about um, that loss of language in the, in the assimilated, assimilation process mm -hmm. in recent immigrants in, in New Jersey. And your background is, in, is also, apart from in, in, in visual art and in poetry, mm -hmm. also in, in sociolinguistics? Yeah, yeah, for a time I mm -hmm. studied sociolinguistics. I almost finished a PhD in it, but I only took a master's in it because I, I was really interested in, in learning about kind of the politics of language, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so... Um, so I started to, yeah, it was, I was writing a nonfiction essay at first about comparing language use mm -hmm. in, in that part of New Jersey and also in rural Ireland and, and how silence figured but in different ways and trying to figure out what the rules of speech were. Um, and I got, I don't know, I wrote maybe a couple thousand words and I just was really bored. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is really boring. And was it, was it taking on, you know, elements of kind of academic writing or something? Was that it? I didn't or? want to. Yeah. Um, you know, I really, I wanted it to be more, I was thinking, I had read a lot of Rebecca Solnit and the way that she could take really complex and, and very varied um, subjects mm -hmm. and kind of weave them into a really interesting nonfiction mm -hmm. approach. And so I was thinking about doing something like that. But after a time, I just thought, this is not, this is going from writing poetry, which I had done mostly before, to this was, it just wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And so um, then, um, then I just started to um, kind of, in, at the beginning of the book really starts um, it, it, almost on the way that it's laid out on the page, it's, it's poetry. So I started to write kind of more narratives of uh, a character living in that place mm -hmm. and using that language in, from the point of view of poetry. And that was the springboard then into the real writing. Um, so, that, that, at the, so at the start, that, that, was, that felt like the natural um, uh, medium for mm -hmm. you to use. Was poetry, yeah. yeah. And, but then that allowed the prose to start to come. Mm -hmm. um, and so then it was like, okay, well, I've got something going here. You know, there's traction. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't hear a voice. I couldn't hear um, the main character's voice. And I don't know how it happened, but I just thought, all right, well, I'm going to call her Una. I've always liked that name, mm -hmm. and I like, the I like the way that Una looks on the page. I like the two O's. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, if I'm writing about her and how she is not very good at using language, and there's also kind of a part of her missing because she has, uh, the story starts to unfold that she's lost her mother, mm -hmm. and no one in the family is telling her that the mother who is dying is not... It, no one is telling her that the, the mother is dying. Mm -hmm. So there's this silence at the core of her story. So then I just thought, well, what if I took away the O's? And so then I just started writing and Because choosing. automatically she's, she's lost half her name. I mean, yes. Well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like she's, very dramatic, isn't it? She yeah. knows with like those two letters gone. Yeah. Yeah. And so then it just, I, it just became a little game, you know, that mm -hmm. um, you often do in poetry with rhyme or meter. And it just became another kind of constriction that you work within. Mm -hmm. And then I really started to hear the 
the voice, the kind of um, awkwardness or a little bit stilted. Yeah, you see, I don't because I didn't find that at all. In fact, I, <laughs> I found, um, and I think maybe it is because you're 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 also a poet. Is um, um, there, there's a kind of a rhythm in the sentences or mm -hmm. something, and, and maybe it is because um, there are certain sounds that just aren't available at all, and that automatically mm -hmm. um, picks up. I mean, so there are going to be patterns, aren't yeah, there? You totally. know, there's a whole group of you know one Pre prepositions. Yeah. You can't use prepositions exactly. of, on, for, to, yeah. all that stuff. It's out. all gone. Yeah. yeah. So maybe, yeah, maybe it did start to create a kind of rhythm to mm -hmm. the language, but it became, it just became really fascinating for me to do it, mm -hmm. and and there was just joy in the writing. I mean, it wasn't always easy, but it made me have a dictionary and a thesaurus to hand, mm -hmm. and I love that. And I just love the kind of problem of figuring out how to say yeah. room, yeah. mother. But even in, in Patterson, when it's sin, S-I-N at the end and stuff, mm -hmm. so some of it is kind of, you know, it, it, it's quite playful yeah. too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the sins of the father, Patterson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and then I, I suppose, I, I'm wondering about um, the idea of um, like so. So it is a book about grief, but it's not just grief for um, you know or long for a lost parent. Um, um, there's something about a, a heritage or a belonging, and there, I think there's mm. you know in, in the sense of, um, of 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 place that's um, that's evoked where Una even, you know, even where Una feels out of place. Mm -hmm. She's out of place in New Jersey and mm -hmm. then out of place when she, she moves to Ireland. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there's definitely a, a longing for, um, I think, you know, the beginning of the book is very fragmented. There, there's a lot of the book that's about fragmentation. So there's this longing in her um, recovery from grief for a kind of cohesion inside herself, for a kind of fluency mm -hmm. um, of herself. Um, and there's also a sense of wanting more of a sense of cohesion about where she comes from. So she has this interest in history that she, she doesn't find a whole lot of in the community that she grows up in, or even in the, in the country that she becomes a part of. Um, so I think the trip early on in the book back to Ireland changes her life. It kind of, she never forgets it, even though she comes back to the US with her family and goes to school and, and then her mother dies. She eventually finds her way back to Ireland. And in Ireland, there's a way, I think, that she can reconnect with that history mm -hmm. um, because that's where her family has come from. So there's a, a sense, even though she's, and now an outsider in another way, mm -hmm. in another place, there's a sense of um, getting connected up to the larger picture and the larger context mm -hmm. of where her family comes mm -hmm. from. Um, although um, there's only in the book the, the story of where the grandmother comes from in Roscommon. Um, but there's also a sense of cohesion that she starts to find in the little the little things that people do in the village where she's still a stranger, but there's stuff where um, she, finds, um, she finds people very fluent, um, very talkative, very mm -hmm. chatty, and in a way she's, she likes that. And I can, re I can read you a little bit from yeah, the book great. Yeah. Um, about that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, where do I have it? Yeah, so this is a short chapter called T. Um, let me find it here, chapter 64. The first years were T years. <clears throat> Any time, day, night, didn't matter. When a friend's fist wrapped the glass, it was chat time. Bun time, digestive bicky time, hang and butter sandwich time. Even I that didn't like tea made berries after berries with milk never black. Fergal put half the sugar bag in, us at the table, rain battering the glass, RTE blaring, cars splashing the puddles at the turn in the bridge, sheep baaing in the lane, passing the time with tea and talk. Fergal chatted, chatted, I straightened the placemat, aligned knife with napkin, turned milk jug perpendicular, crushed crumbs under my fingers, brushed them in little piles beside the little sugar crystal piles silently measured which pile was higher, tasted them, 
pushed them under my fingernails, dug them free, listened. He said there were days when the entire village was in sync with a fire insurance scheme. Guys actually burned their farms deliberately and claimed the insurance. There was a schedule. Every farmer agreed which guy was burning which day, and each, each guy's farm each guy's farm would blaze, and then they'd make the claim. Burn in turn, they called it. It persisted. Claims piled up until the Dublin insurance guys figured what was happening, started investigating, and the scheme went defunct. Then there was the German TV crew that came and filmed Fergal sticking a live flapping duck up the chimney in a damp place near Kiju. He claimed it was the best old Irish cleaning way. Black wings, the crater. He'd evilly laugh. It was anarchy. It was pure anarchy, he said, the way I like it. He said, chimbly. He said he was frightened. He said, if I'd been educated, I'd be really harmful. As it is, I'm just a muck savage. Then he'd leave because he said there was a little mystery needed investigating in French Park, and Fergal was just the man. In the early days, I'd jump in the van, and he'd drive every bumpy lane, telling me the disappeared names and faces, when they emigrated, and why. Then came the Germans and Dutch. They rescued the old places that had fallen to bits. They plastered and heated them, made them dry, dug the fields, planted spuds, cabbages, leeks, filled the quiet yards up with children's cries again. I think he liked them because it was like traveling. He'd wrap their glass, plunk at their farm tables, hear the Dutch and German ways. He was interested in everything, big man bear that he was. Hands like grisly paws, cupping the steaming mug heavy with sugar. I heard that back in the day when he was drinking, punters gave him wide berths because they knew he'd easily kill a man with the hands, even if he wasn't meaning. As it was, he wasn't drinking when I knew him. If I heard, if he heard, there was a man in Kerry that was in deep shit with the drink, Fergal jump in the van and drive Ireland. Help, help was his way. He dug friends' graves. He scattered my steps with fresh-cut greenery at Christmas. February 1st, St. Bridget's Day, he'd scatter spring buds again at May Day. A great man in a crisis is what they said. It was true. He was true, even with all the fibs he spun. Um, so... I suppose there's something very uh, different there about the relationship with having someone like that come into the house um, com compared <laughs> with the carry on in, 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 uh, in New Jersey. Mm. Um, but, but you said something earlier about, um, about language um, and the use of it and how um, sometimes that um, there wasn't actually really anything being said. So there was mm -hmm. a lot of chat mm -hmm. um, yeah. when Una gets to Ireland, but, um, but, but a lot of it is, is, is just, as you said, blather. So yeah, yeah, yeah. do you want to tell me about yeah, that? Yeah. So there's like, uh, what, what I'm trying to, to write about in the book is her, her getting to this rural place and on the one hand being um, completely bowled over by the the verbal gymnastics of the people in the village. Um, and in a way, this character, Fergal, is, he, he, he is of that ilk. And he can talk um, and chat and drink cups of tea and tell these great stories. Um, and then there's, there's two dimensions to that. I think in that chapter, what she sees and what she starts to, I think, and is part of her, her cohesion, her beginning to cohere with herself, but also in her community, is what what she starts to see and call being decent. You know, just that decency of someone showing up at the door um, on Christmas with fresh greenery, or when someone's grave need, needs to be dug, that that he's there. Um, and this wasn't something that was very apparent in the. New Jersey that she grew up in, where time is money and people are always busy and they don't really have time for each other. Certainly they don't have time to just mm -hmm. sit and chat. It's mm -hmm. a waste of time. Mm -hmm. One could be earning money. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, so there's that on the one hand. There's language as a kind of um, linking um, salve that connects people one to the other in a real way. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's this other way of using language when 
the developers start to move into the village. You know, this is part of the narrative of the story that this development, kind of like urban farms, starts to be built in her community. So she starts like New Jersey is following her over to this rural village. Yeah, I love how that's written as well because it's this sort of slow dawning horror. It's like, oh my gosh, this is happening yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, like she can't get away from yeah. it. It's coming. Um, and when the villagers start to see what's happening, they, she, she starts to notice that they don't talk about it directly. Um, and when they talk about it, even when they're upset, they use a lot of words, but they're not saying, this is shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. They're just, and, and so this confuses her, and so I'm trying to document that too, mm -hmm. how like, words can just be used to say nothing or to misdirect. And at one point in the book, um, she says, I began to notice that whenever something was really important, you could be sure that it was the thing that wouldn't be mentioned. Okay. You know, like after the conversation, you'd see all the things that were talked about, but the one thing that wasn't mentioned was the thing, okay. you know? Yeah, a lot so, of talking around things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so uh, do you want to read, you've, uh, have you got another excerpt? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will. Um, yeah, this is a little bit more on that, um, on that subject of the language. It's called gab. Mm -hmm. True silence is an interval, a space, <clears throat> a blessed rest within a restless gale. Ilya Kaminsky says that silence is invented by the hearing, that the deaf, deaf abjure silence. Even if they are frequently elided in usage, silence isn't the same as unspeaking. Unspeaking can be a malignancy. I arrived in the village as an individual hurt by unspeaking, specifically hers, meaning Una's mother, which had impeded my ways with speech internally and externally as well. I have been so dislanguaged by what happened, as David Ferry puts it. Gab attracted me. I was awed by the way a villager might spend 15 minutes telling a stranger that the weather hadn't yet exceeded summer 1995 when they had their tea in the garden every evening that June and July and swam in the river after as the heat was withering. In New Jersey, the summers were always steaming, and New Jersey denizens spent little time in discussing it. Did better weather engender clipped speech? That seemed simplistic, like mistaken essentialism, but I felt that by immersing myself in that gabby place, I might be reinstated with a linguistic fluency that had been nearly extinguished in me. By what? By the suburbs? By the market? By death denial? By whiteness? By the USA? I wasn't sure, but I had inklings. Having the chat became my language rehab lab. I'd watch the pitch and catch pattern that set up between practiced rural Irish chatterers. Neither held the chat ball very much. It was always pitched back. That way the talk circulated and didn't stagnate. With finesse, they ex executed gymnastic verbal timings, witticisms, rare earnestness, and much laughter. I watched as Americans, including me, held the ball, thinking, 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 as that scintillating chat energy leaked away. Language was indeed a circuit, a game. It required, at the very least, a pair. That kept the chat aerated and alive. And language demanded time as well, giving and taking time. Immersed in that chat lab, I was listening, listening, listening. A speech urge might rise like an inner tide inside, but my larynx wasn't very supple. Language slid back in my gullet and sat there, weighty. I felt the backed up talk accumulating in my flesh, hardening and thickening in my cells, a sticky plugged upness. It felt like a cancer, a particularly female cancer as it happens, as many males are permitted speech at the start are benighted with speech entitlements. Their speech rights are given at birth. They talk, talk, talk if, if they want. Many females struggle in reaching fluency, hesitating, feeling unentitled, checking their veracity against men's. What a lifetime it can take finding that speech right. First inside, 
then translating that talk and making it external talk. It's hard graft, building that internal external linkage, then flinging language in a marketplace, a lecture hall, a farm gate, a village green, a piazza, a street. Yet it is a leavening. Grace. Grace. Um, so I want to ask you about, um, uh, so, so the book opens with, um, with uh, uh, Una as a child um, who has really not been told that her mother is dying. So mm-hmm. it just happens and then mm-hmm. her mother is pretty much gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it means that, um, th- that in the community she lives in, there's really in a generation um, that these people have lost all of their ability to mourn and grieve, that all of that is gone. Yeah. So along with you know, the language and everything else that's been, been wiped away, mm-hmm. that's been taken away too. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'd I, I just love to, to, um, to ask you about the, the contrast between that and then what happens when, when Una moves to Ireland. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the, um, I think in the, um, in that landscape, that suburb that she grows up in, because there is this um, veneer of privilege and that everybody's got enough dash to um, take care of themselves, there's this sense, too, that when death happens and, and occurs in a family, that the community isn't needed. Um, It's funny, it reminds me of um, somebody the other day was talking about Margaret Thatcher and how she said there is no such thing as society. Society, And in a way, I think that's what happened in this this suburb is that those social um, bonds begin to be taken away by the project of everybody, uh, you know, pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. Yeah, it's that kind of rampant individualism. Completely, Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there's the contrast between that and then when Una gets to rural Ireland and starts to see um, the, the rituals around the wake and the funeral and the, um, just the, again, the decent things that people do for each other. And the, um, I re- uh, the, there's, a, there's a part um, that she, she writes about where she sees the, um, the woman neighbor who's constantly listening to the radio and for the, um, the announcements for the of the death, deaths, you know? Yeah. And then the whole phenomenon now of RIP.ie. Mm-hmm. But that, that's, like, you know, people really, like, everybody knows how well, to some, use... Some people check that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that kind of thing. Um, those social bonds. I mean, I hope... The book, I hope, builds from that sense of fragmentation and incoherence, really, within the, the person of the, the protagonist. And it tries to bring about a sense of cohesion, kind of very slow cohesion. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and part of that is um, the, the cohesion that she starts to see um, happen through the decent acts of just, kindness isn't, isn't even the right mm-hmm. word. Mm-hmm. I think kindness is too kind of Christian a word or mm-hmm. something, but I just think the, the decent mm-hmm. thing, the best thing you can say yeah. about a person in uh, rural Ireland is that they're decent. decent you yeah. know? They're a decent mm-hmm. person. So I think that that starts to um, um, create a sense of cohesion that, again, is always threatened by the, this development, the developers moving in and kind of selling the land mm-hmm. and this whole, um, the whole rampant market that that starts to mm-hmm. come into the rural community. Uh, how would you feel about, you know that passage about, like, if there's a, the, the passage about the, the fields and stuff? Mm-hmm. Would Tell me a little bit more what oh, no, happens in it. Actually, do you know what? Is it page 74 about the developers? Oh, yeah, right. I love okay. that. Yeah. Which, how do you feel about reading sure, that? Sure, yeah. Page 74 or chapter seven? Oh, sorry. Se- chapter chapter 70. 74 is page okay, 183. It's so funny, you write a book and publish it and then you never look at it. You know, <laughs> you're, like you're totally so involved with in it. Time. Yeah. Uh, okay, oh yeah, yeah, right. Sure. This is chapter 74. Um, when the village went septic, when rural renewal had made it an urban farm, I went septic myself. Blind in my eyes and in my feelings, I knew I was enraged, but I didn't have a clue at what. A skewed lad had made a sign that said, Developers and marched with it as if the dudes with the land. Diggers and cash 
had been devils. And it was true, they had been dirty dealers, but they weren't in instigating things. Implicated, yes, yet they were pawns as well. The culprit was larger and diffuser, was invisible and mighty, like the Bible's guy in the sky, if that guy in the sky were practiced in usury. Where was it? What might I rant at? What might I fight? I was blind and wanted sight. I fear I'd crumble inward, rage like Ezra P. did at usury, but misguidedly, aimlessly, diffusely. I needed perspective and distance, yet I was immersed and enswamped. Where might my rage be aimed? Film, being a seeing medium and a material that might capture reality and give perspective, might give a clue, I mulled. I hired a massive reflecting surface. Thing was as big as a king-size mattress. Rigged it standing up in a trailer, clamped a 16 millimeter film camera there, aimed it half at the glass and half at the real scene and cruised the streets. A Latvian friend manned my VW diesel pulling a trailer. There was a deep January freeze and river mist gripped the village hard. The film trapped the unwinding scenes in split screen. Pebble dash dwellings, drenched fields, lichen flecked walls, winter hedges, beech trees, the pebble dash church, the pubs, a guy in high vis gear, a kid gang gripping crisp bags and waving at us. All were filmed at half actual and half reflected. The ugly, half built estates were mist scrimmed and mystery filled in that weather, bettered. At dusk, everything went purple, and the sulfur streetlights made blurry, citrus-hued spheres that scattered and diffused amber light in driplets as if Syrah was painting the village. Heartbreaking in its beauty and its strange, skewed splitness, the film is a relic I will keep, a life in the village remnant, a priceless lifetime trapped in amber. Yet the filming was a failure as a distancing, critical lens with which I might see and understand what had happened. Summing up wasn't within my reach. I erred, perhaps, if I weigh up what I captured in gathering a certain thing even when I wasn't aiming at it. Beauty jumped in that Latvian-driven trailer, in that massive reflective glass in the camera lens. Beauty flirted with and French kissed the sensitive 16 millimeter film deep in the camera and beauty tickled the megapixels in the sensing machine in the DSLR, sorry, DSLR until it gave up and let itself be utterly seduced. I didn't want it. I spurned it and turned away, yet beauty kept at me and the hired cameras. A single scene that lifted beauty's hem and went beneath it. I directed the driver that he pass with the glass in the trailer again and again by the distinctively tall sign advertising the new estates. It was a high rectangular affair rigged with a two by four, rigged with two by four stilts like an elevated pulpit with Badger Ridge in serif lettering and the estate agent's name and website in Helvetica. We fixed the film camera's lens at an ancient hand-built wall with a Leyland cypress hedge behind and a steel gray sky in the frame's upper half. As the glass and trailer pass by the viewfinder, the tall estate agent's sign disappears and appears as the trailer exits the frame stage left. We did many takes at different speeds and edited, edited them in a sequence that animates the sign, making it a spectral presence appearing in the sky, interrupting the hedge, and then vanishing. Maybe it helped place the activity in a larger time frame that the land and the hedges and the sky at least might remain after the market had pillaged the place like an avenging angel. Single thing that camera delicately articulated in that generally failed film experiment, the market mightn't gulp everything. That's wonderful. Great. Um, so yeah, just before we finish up, Alice, I just want to ask you, uh, we've been talking earlier about um, about um, about grief and mourning and decency, and I'm just wondering um, um, what you think about uh, the last few months with the <laughs> pandemic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's been crazy. Um, I mean, like, I mean, it's an understatement. But um, I was thinking so much about um, 
the parallels in, in the book um, with not being able to visit the dead and not being able to touch them and to um, it, it go to a funeral um, afterwards and just how, how that ripped at the soul mm -hmm. of people in Ireland mm -hmm. and how people know that it just isn't right. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to find ways. I myself just attended a funeral over the weekend where you know, we're in this kind of partial lockdown mm -hmm. or unlocking now. And you can just see how people are really trying hard to behave mm -hmm. and, you know, with the social distancing. Well, it's like to try and hold back. Trying very to hold hard. back, yeah. especially hold, trying to hold back a hug of mm -hmm. someone who's mm -hmm. grieving. You know? But people are doing it, and there's masks, and there's dis you know, we're, we're trying to find our way, but you can just see how unnatural it mm -hmm. is. And I think that encourages me. Like, we're not going to get used to this. No. You know, we're not. No. Um, and, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's still, I, I still just feel very, very badly for the people who, who didn't get to, yeah. to be there in those last moments. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, that's just uh, a, a tragedy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet, I suppose the decency is still, is still there too, totally. you know, with uh, people shopping for for neighbors and exactly yeah. god you saw that i mean god i got to know so many neighbors um, yeah, that's through it. It. that was a, a benefit yeah. definitely and that decency sure mm -hmm. it's there it's it's so much mm -hmm. um become apparent in that pandemic and and hopefully i mean like that last chapter says you know the market has changed so many things and the pandemic has kind of slowed that down and i think one thing we've all um, gotten back is the sense of how precious time is, mm -hmm. how we might use our time differently, mm -hmm. um, but also how precious we are to each other and yeah. what we can do to each other. So, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully those things are going to continue. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. great. Alice, thank you so much. Thank it's you, been great Louise. to talk to you. Thank um, you. So, um, th this is Una's book, or Alice's book, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to say that again. Uh, so, this is. Um, uh, Una by Alice Lyons, and um, it's published by Lilliput Press, and it's available in all the bookshops. We like independent bookshops, though, don't we? Yeah. Um, all yeah. good independent all bookshops. All good independent bookshops. Yeah. yeah. Or Lilliput Press. Yeah. Sell it too. So, so Alice, thanks so much. Thank Louise. you very much. It's great.